Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Sorry we got a little bit of a slow start, but we are here. That was my fault. <laughs> It's we'll okay. never know the things Emery has seen. You know, it's like, I'm going to say it was an experience, um, and I'm sorry to everybody who missed it. They, they really missed out today. <laughs> it, was, it was interesting. It was interesting. Um, so, yeah. So, hello, everybody. Welcome to Me Cute Mondays, where we talk YA books and romance um, with some amazing YA authors. Um, today, I am here with the author of Like a Love Song. Would you like to pitch your book? Yeah, so I am Gabriela Martins. I am a Brazilian author, and I wrote this very Brazilian book that takes place in Los Angeles, actually, because my main character, although she is Brazilian, she is an internationally famous pop star. She gets dumped fantastically uh, on live television, and she becomes a meme. So after that, her agency's new plan to, you know, take her off uh, the spotlight, the negative spotlight and the tabloids is to give her a fake boyfriend. So this is where things get interesting. <laughs> interesting. Yeah, I love it because we both obviously wrote um, fake dating rom-coms. Mine is about a trans boy named Noah who runs a romance blog. Ah, oh, I love that you have it. <laughs> and this so is when his blog is- People come to Brazil to like fight me for my arc. Yeah, I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna tell people there's like, there's like a handful of copies that went out like globally. So you just have to like hunt down whoever has one and like fight them for it. Um, but yeah, so my book is about um, a trans boy who runs a romance blog, and when it's threatened by a troll, he fake dates a fan in order to stage the perfect romance and prove that his blog is real, even though it's obviously all fake. Um, but yeah, I love it, and I love um, I love the humor. Like I love the, that we both went this like like route of like these disaster stories, like kind of blowing up for our poor main characters. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if, if we don't make them suffer and go through <laughs> these extremely tragic events, but in a funny way for us. Like, don't get me wrong, if you are being chased by a troll like this, and if I were, if I had, if, if I became like an internet meme in that way, we would be so upset about this. <laughs> like, we would be like really upset, but it's our characters. So we're like, ha ha ha. Yeah, it sucks to be you. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, so it's amazing, yeah. Yeah, I mean, to be fair though, I kind of wrote, I feel like I wrote Noah in a way that kind of makes you like enjoy shitting on him. Like, no <laughs> offense to poor Noah, like, but like he's kind of, he's a diva and he's like kind of annoying sometimes. So like, when you're like, oh, look at you, sucks to suck, Noah. Just kidding, I love him, but also sucks to suck. <laughs> well, I, I, I am in love with him. And I just want to take a moment to talk about the illustrations in the cover. Like they are so beautiful. I love this one because it's like it's so casual, but like <laughs> you know, like they are. I don't know. It's it's mirrored, so it's difficult. But yeah, <laughs> and even the like no, like this. Even the no here here no. Here. Guys, this is very hard for me. Uh, <laughs> even, like, the little heart in diary. It's like. Yeah, it's, you know, um, everyone watching this, this is just like a pretty book to have, you know, like even if you don't read, it's just <laughs> objectively pretty. So it's just good to keep it around as like decoration, you know. You exactly, just, exactly. Like <laughs> there to want to have meet cute diary, so just buy it, pre-order. So. I agree. And anybody who's watching, if you follow me on Twitter, if you go to my pinned tweet, you'll find the cover artist and the um, the designer um, who put together the book. So um, go follow them and thank them for making this book very pretty. It is. It's so pretty. I love the colors too. Yeah. I want to show off my cover. I don't have physical arcs, but it's so pretty. Show us what you got. Show it. <laughs> So my cover uh, was designed by Case Moses and illustrated by Eric Davila. And look at it. No. 
Look at it. Uh, 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 uh. I love the dress because, so like, let me tell you the story of this dress, right? So the, the, the draft of the cover was actually something else. And then um, my wonderful design, uh, cover designer, Case Moses, she was like, okay, I love the dress, but um, how about you actually take the dress she wears in the first chapter and uses it and like draws the dress she actually wears. That's so, cool. this is the dress she actually, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> so, this is actually the dress she wears in the first chapter. And I love the dress, <laughs> it's so pretty. I'm like, I, I want the dress. Can it should be like, I feel like a thing, like where like everybody just like wears like the same dress and like shows up to like an event for like your book, like everyone just. Oh. <laughs> I would love that. I would love that. I, I would just be like, hi. <laughs> you know, with the train of the dress for like meters and meters and meters. And meters. <laughs> it's not my fault. My character is a pop star. Like, I'm like, give me pop star money and I'll, I'll have like seven dresses. Cause I, <laughs> I can yeah. use like a nice, like fabulous long train dress. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah, mean, everyone buy my book so that I can afford a dress like the one on Gabby's cover, please. Because, like, yeah. <laughs> please, please. I don't even, I, I just want to have like this one dress that is like really expensive. I don't need to have like multiple ones. I just need one that I will wear to absolutely all occasions. <laughs> I don't care that people will be like, oh, is that the only dress she has? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Yes. So, you know, so. Yeah. I mean, if you have one dress, it's that nice. Like, why, why would you wear anything else? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll be honest. What's the use of having like a big wardrobe? We all only wear the same like four <laughs> or five clothes. Like, like I literally, I mean, to be fair, I rotate. So like, I'll have like one week or like, I'll have like, I'll have like a month and a half where it's like, okay, these like four things. And then like, after that, it's like, okay, now these. <laughs> okay, you are much more into fashion than I am. <laughs> I, I can admire like the aesthetics of it. Like I can look at a person that is well-dressed and be like, wow, you're so well-dressed but I cannot replicate that. <laughs> no, I, I am always wearing the same stuff every single time. I remember one time when I was still a high school teacher and you know how they do not care and they will say whatever is on their mind. So I had a student and, and we only had like Monday classes and he was like, teacher, do you not have other clothes? And I was <laughs> like, well, do you not have a washing machine? <laughs> but <laughs> I don't know what's the point of having multiple clothes. I don't know. I, I, don't know I feel like that's me with shoes. I have like 40 pairs of shoes and they just sit in my closet looking pretty. And like occasionally I'll pull one down and be like, wow, these are so pretty. Like if only I, I would ever wear them and like put them back and be like, okay, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> like, I wear like I have, especially now in the pandemic, so I am the caretaker of my grandparents, right? So I only go out, the things I go out for is like drive them to their medical appointments, go to the grocery store for them. Yeah, that's the extent of my, <laughs> of my like, social life now. Um, and I have by the door, I have like these sandals. That's all I've been wearing since March of last year. It's like flip flops at home and then these sandals to go out. I have not worn anything else. And, and that's, that's it. Yeah. Like, I think I have like three pairs of shoes that I rotate like total, like you're even without, even not in the pandemic. I have like three pairs of shoes that I rotate like total. And that's it. Yeah. I, I wish I could be one of those people, you know, like I have a friend, she actually paid a specialist. Did you know that there are people that will like look at the color of your eye, your skin and your hair? 
And with that combination, they'll be like, oh, you are like a spring person. Or, you know, I, I don't know, like apparently that's a job. And then, you know, they will change your entire wardrobe depending on like that combination. And she paid someone. And it's like, it's good money too. And bought like a bunch of new clothes and they're all very stylish. And don't get me wrong, she looks amazing in all her new clothes, but I'm like, why? Why? I have clothes from when I was in high school and I still wear them. Same. <laughs> we, we give new meaning to like millennials dressing like teenagers because we, <laughs> literally it's, it's the same clothes we wore back then. It's like, they're just I mean, old. To be, to be fair though, like, like if your clothes still fit and they're not like broken and like, like why right. would you like, you know, like I just, I, 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 like I understand like, you know, like yeah, sometimes you just need new clothes. Like, I get that. But like, come on, like, like I'm not going to throw out like a shirt that I have since high school. If it still fits, it still looks good. Like, I'm still going to wear it. Like who cares? Yeah. Yeah. And Emery, I have, I, I love how this has absolutely nothing to do with romance. And to be fair, my main character <laughs> would be horrified to hear me talk like this because she's super into fashion or whatever. But I, I don't get it at all. And I am the type of person that, like, if you tell me, like, oh, um, this new restaurant, like, post-pandemic or before pandemic, whatever, this new restaurant opened and it's, like, $40 to eat, I'll be like, okay, let's do it. But if you tell me these shoes are $40, I'll be like, that's a ripoff. <laughs> I will never pay forty dollars for shoes. I won't pay twenty. I won't. I won't pay. So <laughs> ninety percent of my wardrobe is like gifts. It's like my friends or my family being like, "You have got to stop wearing those shoes or those clothes." That like you have got to stop. So we are giving you this new one, but you have to give us the old one. Oh my god. So like I don't I don't mind spending money with food because I really like food. But yeah, I, I don't even buy it. Like I don't buy like clothes. It's always expensive for me. Sometimes my mom will be like, I just bought these shoes and it was a steal. And I'm like, yeah, they just stole your money. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, but to be fair, like I feel like I have a lot of, a lot of feelings about that. <laughs> like I know like my main character like he likes clothes but like to be fair like he would be like you know I need a couple outfits to like match my aesthetic to like feel good you know but like he's not gonna be like he, he would he would definitely pass up clothes for food like food is definitely like priority yeah. like yeah mm -hmm. like food is food is important like I like whenever people are like you know like I don't understand spending money on food I'm like food <laughs> food <laughs> like that's everything <laughs> I'll be honest with you, I, I think it's because like, uh, I come from generational poverty. So like my family used to struggle a lot with a lot of things. So I, I used to feel very guilty about spending money on just about everything. But food, it's, it's something that, you know, gives you so much comfort. You know, you, you eat food and you're like transport. I, I don't know. I have a, a good experience with food. I know this is not um, the same for everyone, of course. But yeah, I don't know. I I don't mind spending money on food. I, I would 100% be that person that would be like, oh, that super fancy chef that, you know, uh, like charges 100 for like a like a little food. <laughs> of something yeah obviously let me pay like all of my ears earnings for that <laughs> but yeah when it comes to anything else i'm like this, this. there's a saying in portuguese that um so i would say that i am so cheap that i could cross the ocean with sand in in the palm of my hand <laughs> and i would get to the other side <laughs> The sand would still be there. That's how tight fisted I am. Yeah, like I mean, 
It, and it's not a good thing, by the way. <laughs> it's, <laughs> I mean, it is, it is what it is. Like, I feel like my, I feel like my parents like raised me to be very like, like cheap too. Like I'm very like, like everything, like use everything. Don't, don't let anything get wasted. Like I remember I, my great grandmother, when I was a kid, like, I'm still scarred for life, but I remember we had expired milk in our fridge. Like it was expired, like it smelled expired. And she was like, we're not throwing away good milk. And she just drank that. And I'm like scarred for life. But like, I, yeah, like I feel like, like what you were saying about like food, like I feel like, like I feel like for me, like food is super like it's like cultural, but it's also like it's like comfort, and it's also like I feel like bonding, like the way you like bond with people, like when you share food. I feel like it's so intimate. Like I feel like it's something like I don't feel like an intimate relationship with someone who compliments my clothes, but like if I cook something for them and they're like, "This is damn good," I'll be like, "Shit, okay, let's get married." Like you know, like <laughs> yeah, it's it's like um, it, it, we really do cook with feelings, right? It's, it's it's deep. It's a different connection. I love that. Yeah, I definitely agree with you. And I love that you mentioned like the thing about expired because in my family, <laughs> and, and you're Latinx, so like this is definitely a Latinx thing because in my <laughs> family, <laughs> uh, my grandma says we don't believe in expired. So, <laughs> this is um, my mom says that when products have the expired on them, this is a conspiracy of the government to make us pay for food again when it's still good. <laughs> and the other day I was like, I was talking to my grandma and was like, oh, I, I ate this yogurt and I'm not feeling so well. Maybe uh, it had gone bad. And she was like, did it have hair on it? <laughs> oh, no. And she was like, if it didn't have hair on it, it was good. <laughs> But okay. uh, yeah, I, I hesitate to, to throw away food, even if when it's expired. I will admit I eat expired food. I, I I'm very I'm very like eh, it says expired, but is it really? And like I'm also like like I'll leave food in my fridge and be like, you know what? I'm gonna keep this just in case. <laughs> I'm like, in case yeah. of what? It's cold in there. You know, it's cold in there. And like so it's frozen. If it's frozen, I have I have uh, ice cream from like three birthdays ago in my <laughs> and it's gonna keep there. And when I feel hot, I'm gonna eat it. So, like I feel like like people say like don't like freeze and then like refreeze meat. And I'm like no no you can refreeze it. And I'm like when you take it out of the freezer, it rest it resets the the deadline. Like as long as it's not like sticky or smelly, it's fine. Like <laughs> It's all very, you know, questionable. It's like, you know, um, it's it's questionable. I feel like especially, <laughs> especially if you have Latinx blood, then you're like you are resistant. Yeah, probably, to, yeah, honestly. <laughs> Just like intergenerational, we like we like develop like a special bacteria where like we can eat expired food, I guess, and then okay. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. What was it that I ate that was like super expired? And I told my friend the Deepa Jagger Dar, she was like, Why did you eat expired food? And I'm like, what was I supposed to do? Like let it go to waste? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, I get like I get like physical pain. Like I literally like like my, my chest hurts when I throw out food. Like I'm like, I like I'll just be like, I can't I can't do it. I can't throw it out. Like, yeah, I can't. And, and like if you throw away food, it's going to be like sticky in your trash can, and like there will be those little flies around. So eat it. Yeah. <laughs> don't, don't, don't throw it away. <laughs> so, <laughs> do you want to? Do you want to um, answer questions as they come, or do you want to do like a question segment at the end? Um. What do you prefer? Um, you know what? Let's just answer as they come so we don't lose them. <laughs> do it. Let's do it. So we shouldn't be talking about expired food for an hour. Okay. <laughs> okay yeah. So when you write your characters, do you write parts of yourself you wish you were or people you admire? I feel like Jay De La Vega is out to get me. <laughs> I'm personally offended by this. Uh, block and report. <laughs> you know man <laughs> do you want to answer this first 
Yeah, I can go first. I can go first. Okay, so, um, so when I write my characters, um, do I write parts of myself? You know, I wish I was, or people I might. Yes, I write. Yes, I write both. I write. I feel like my characters are like a combination of like unresolved trauma that I didn't realize I needed to express in fiction to actually cope with, um, and then like the way I see myself like but like more fun like taking like the way i see myself like when i'm like being like fabulous and like cool and shit and then being like okay that person not like the me like you know laying in bed all day um and then like uh, with a mix of like like things where i'm like oh like like if there's like somebody that i think is super cool or, like a character that i think is really cool or like funny or something like i'll usually like, throw sprinkles of that in so it's basically like just like a weird like stew of like my of like pieces of me like pieces of like who I wish I could be but like who I like see myself as like in a more positive light and then like other like things that I just kind of like internalize from like other people so I think the key word here is trauma mm. that's, that's a good so one. It, doesn't, it doesn't matter what you were writing like we were writing rom-coms and our <laughs> you're going to carry our trauma it's just like I I promise you all, I try, but all of my characters have daddy issues. Okay, all my characters have mommy issues, so we're like... <laughs> I try. It's like, I, I try, right? It's like, is that a central thing to my to my main character, Nachi, in, in like a love song? But she was still abandoned by her father. At one point, it comes out. So, like, I think that... I think we when we write... Um, so I, I write um, premise first, right? I come up with the premise of the story first, and then the characters come later. They kind of claim their thrones, right? And I think I, I think there's all characters, even minor characters, they all have this aspect that is a little uh, self biographical, and we hate it. But it's like, you got to do it. Um, and then I, I don't think it's, um, it's, I don't think it's on purpose, right? I don't, I'm not, I don't think I'm trying to write things that I wish I were. I think I'm trying to write, especially when I'm writing teens, I am always in conversation to, with the person I was as a teenager because I had a, my life was hell when I was a teenager. So um, when I'm writing teens, way more than children, I am trying to like speak to the person I was and trying to give her what she needed when she was at that age. And of course, that there's an intersection there that's going to be like, um, you know, trying to fill in the hole of all the things that I was missing there. But it's not a conscious effort. It's something that I, I've noticed in revisions or when my friends point out to me, like, how interesting, you know, that <laughs> that thing happened. Huh. I'm like, mm -hmm. isn't it? Um, but I, I feel like if you don't know me personally, that's probably going to, like, you're going to miss it. And it's fine. You probably don't need to. <laughs> um and, and then people I admire not quite like I but I do like to make um to drop like little things to, to, to people I know and love and admire so when they read my books if they read my books they're gonna be like oh that's for me like in the book that I am writing right now okay this creatures are not going to read my book, but in the book that I'm read, I'm drafting right now, there is a part where my main character has to drop everything and do something. And she leaves her things with these two classmates and they are inspired by my cats. These two characters, they're extremely annoyed with her. They're like, Oh, seriously. Yeah. So you're dropping everything and leaving because you're incompetent. Yeah. And even their names are like inspired by my cats and stuff. So this is kind of the thing that I like to do in terms of like nudging like people I admire. But yeah, that's that's kind of like the extent of it. Really good question. Yeah, I love I love what you said about um, 
about like being in conversation with like who you were as a teenager because I feel like I feel like to a certain extent like like as like YA authors like it's kind of our job to not just consider like what is important to us now or like what yeah. speaks to us now but like what would have spoken to us as, as teens or at least like what speaks to other teens that are like teenagers today um but I think it's like a lot of it is kind of getting into that headspace of like who I was and like what I needed and like what being a teenager is like. And like, I mean, I, I'm totally with you on that. Like my teenagers were hell. Like it was like the absolute worst time of my life. And I think that's kind of why like now I think, like when I was a teenager, I loved dark stories. And I think um, even shortly after like being a teenager, I really liked dark stories where I would kill everybody. Like I would kill all the characters. And I think part of it was just like me trying to like cope with the fact that I was miserable. Um, but like now I'm, as I look back on it, I'm like, you know, honestly, what teen me needed was not like mass murder. It was a hug. So like <laughs> now I'm like writing stories where I'm like, I hope this book gives teen me a hug. And I hope it like, I hope it reaches other teens like me and like tells them, hey, like you need a hug. Like, you know what I mean? Like, like I hope this, I hope this, this, this is calming for you. I hope this feels nice. Like I hope it just kind of like shows you like what love can be. I feel like and I feel like a lot of times too, like, like I said, like I have read a lot of characters with mommy issues and I feel like I write a lot of characters, um, like, and, and I feel like the characters that I write who, who have decent parents, it's always like they have like perfect parents, almost like I'm compensating and I almost don't like realize it until later. I'm like, oh, I was trying to like, you know, give this person what I feel like parents should be as opposed to what my parents were. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> I like that. Um, this thing of like, uh, that, that you mentioned with Dark Stars because same, I was, the exact same as you that you mentioned and i think that it's, it's an important process for us right this this healing of offering ourselves a, an opportunity to like mend uh the past and for me one of the big issues was that i was extremely depressed and I didn't have access to medication or to information really in general. And so I, I didn't know that I could find a place where I belonged. So like I mentioned before, I was a poor teen and I had, um, I had a scholarship in a Catholic school. That was its own, I feel like if you've ever been to Catholic school, you know that it's not a super fun experience in general, but if you go to a Catholic school on a scholarship then the nuns call it poor scholarship, that's like, so it was, it was not nice. So I had to constantly prove that I belonged, but I didn't know that I belonged. So my character's journey, um, Natalie is, a pop star and she is facing very different issues that I faced when I was a teenager. But the core of her story is she's having to prove that she belongs and that she she can, you know, that, that she deserves to occupy space in the world. She has to, to, to go through this journey for her whole life and eventually she has to come to a decision, you know, to whether decide to stop fighting and accept that she is perfect and deserving the way she is, or to accept that she's never going to be fully accepted and she's gonna to have to fight forever. So um, I would love if this message could, I, I would love for team me actually to hold this book and get to the end and be like, oh, I can stop trying so hard because it doesn't matter. You know, I wish that this could happen, but because it can, because time travel is not possible yet, unfortunately, I just hope that it can reach other teams that are going through this and that hopefully they can read this and be like, oh, okay. So maybe I don't have to, keep fighting so hard either because I, I learned that way too late 
yeah i feel like i feel like ultimately like my book is is very similar to like the the idea of noah like being in denver colorado and like be, like fake dating a fan and like i mean having a fan like of a blog like i did not have a popular blog when i was a teenager um but i do feel like i feel like at the core of the book is just like the idea that like you know you're not too trans or too black or too like anything to deserve like a happily ever after and i think when i was in high school i mean i didn't even know i was trans in high school but i knew that i was black and people were very you know and i was asian and they were like we're not okay with that like that's not you know and so i think it was very i was very much convinced that i would never date anyone that i would never find anyone like who would want to date me and i think that that was like a huge thing that i really needed like just as a teenager it's just like that reminder that like even if you know things don't even if romance doesn't work the way that you thought it would or that you expected it to like you still have the like you still deserve to have a romance and like you can still find one and i think that was just yeah. kind of like ended up being like the whole like concept of the book even though like the, the surface i feel like it's not my life like that part was like absolutely like what i needed are you, when I was are, you, are you a romantic i am not anymore <laughs> I yeah I, I used I used to be and now I'm just, I'm I'm not. <laughs> Why not? Are you more? I don't know. You know I think I think part of it is that like as I've gotten older I've seen so many people in like relationships and I started thinking like like I feel like when you read when I read books and I watch movies I'm like oh God I would love that that's so sweet like I love it so much and then I like see people in real life in relationships I'm like ew. <laughs> Like, I don't want to be like you. That sounds awful. So I think, <laughs> I, I think it's, I mean, I, I'm not going to say that like, I'm like, like, I'm not like, ew, romance is gross. Like, but I do think I'm more of like a skeptic now. Just I think in general, like, because, and a part of it is just straight people. Like, and like, no offense, no offense to my straight friends. Cause I have straight friends, but I just, every time I see straight people in relationships, I'm just kind of like, are y'all okay? <laughs> I, feel like, I feel like they do have lower standards. They do. And like, and like even the ones who are like happy for the most part, I feel like sometimes they'll be like, I'm so happy. Like my boyfriend is amazing. And they describe it and I'm like, are, are you okay? <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. And it's like a bob, you know? <laughs> you know? Yeah, and I'm just like, I feel like, so like, I feel like my queer friends have recently started dating more like, which is like, like, I feel like it was like after we graduated college that so my queer friends started finding people. So like, now I see them sometimes, I'm like, oh, that's cute, like, that's cute. But like, yeah, I just feel like I've been like, I've seen so many like horrible relationships. I'm like, why would you want that? Like, I have friends and I'm happy with my friends. Like, I don't need y'all's weird, like convoluted relationships and stuff, I'm good. <laughs> yeah, that, that's fair, that's fair, that makes sense. <laughs> okay, you wanna move on to what, the next question? See what we got here. What's a romance trope you haven't written yet but would love to write next? Hmm. I am a sucker for miscommunication. So anything that could be easily solved with one conversation, I am here for. So because I feel like that's what happens in real life. We hate having honest, direct conversations. We will do literally everything to avoid having these conversations. So I am a sucker for those. I like fake stuff in general. Uh, I really like um, cynical characters, but I feel like they have to be done in a way that's not like, first of all, I feel like straight people, they are on thin ice if they are cynical. <laughs> How can I put this? Um, I don't know, do you know what I mean? Cause it's like, if okay, so when I say this, it's because I'm thinking like, oh, they have like a, the bad boy and he's cynical and then the girl goes through all these lands to like prove to him that love is real. And I'm like, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I get that because I feel like I feel like part of it, too, is like and I think this is just like the way that people execute the trope and stuff. But like you get a lot of times like you get like this like generic white boy who like has no reason to be cynical. And then you have like this girl who's like, way out of his league anyway. And you're like, Why? And, and, and he is always a very tall, 
white man with dark hair and a, 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 a square jaw. <laughs> and, you know, like if, if you see a drawing of him, he could be from any of the books that came out in the last 15 years yep. from a number of genres, actually. So yeah, so this is not really into, but like, so the, the book that I am thinking about, actually, that the book that I'm writing is that it's a, it's a dual pop uh, and he is a romantic. They're both queer, uh, but it's a male female relationship. And he is a super romantic. He, he One of his dreams is to fall in love. He really wants it. And she is like, you're pathetic. Sold. <laughs> I you know, sold. She is, but again, she comes from poverty. Her dad left her mom. Do you see a pattern? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so she's like, love only left my mom as a teenage, like mom having to work multiple jobs. Like this is not, but she sees an opportunity in him to use him. <laughs> so she's like, I'm going to pretend that I'm into this pathetic facade. So this is, I'm really into that kind of, um, that kind of dynamic, because then of course she is proven that being cynical is not a, a good thing and she also has to confront um, her misconceptions and her mistakes. And I like writing that. I like writing characters that have the rug pulled from under their feet and realize that all their views about the world were wrong. Yes, yes, I love that. Yeah, I love, I love, and I love this. I love the dynamic you've got here because already you're like getting rid of like you know the the the, the straightness the the generic white boy like being a bad boy just because he's generic they're like, both oh, it's so hard being generic like shut up like no one cares you're not even and yeah. you know what I hate too is i hate when they do that trope is that like they'll be like oh like he was so unique and like he's so unique because he acts exactly like every other white <laughs> like why i love it exactly, exactly. And, <laughs> the whole unique thing uh it's 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 never a compliment yeah because like we are all unique and that's what makes us all the same. You know, wow. it's paradoxical. We're all special. That's why nobody's special. <laughs> so, so yeah. How about you? What is a romance trope that you would love to write next? I want to write like, um, I want to write like an arranged marriage like story, uh -huh. but like, I, I've written, I've written, wait, I've, ha I've had arranged marriages in like three or four different projects already, but every time is always like the arranged marriage is like between like the one character and like someone who's not the end game. Uh, so it's always like this tension of like, oh, like, you know, I'm in love with you, but you're, you're like engaged to somebody else. But like, I want to do like the arranged marriage, like where they actually fall in love because I, I love that. Like, I love the idea, like it's two people who were brought together by some like outside force, like whether it's like, you know, your parents or like, you know, like, 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 a uh, like government type, like, like hierarchy, like, 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 like a monarchy type thing. Or like, you know what I mean? Like something where you're like, somebody else was like, hey y'all like get married. And then like, you were actually yeah. okay with that? Like, really, like, like kiss, kiss. Yeah, like I just, cause I'm thinking too, and like, I know like, I know it like kind of obviously varies like, across like the world as far as like how arranged marriages work but like i feel like for a lot of cultures like they have been a thing like they were a thing like a long time ago and like they're still kind of a thing today like even like i have an uncle who got married to a woman that he had never met before they got married yeah like it's so like why is it successful the, th the thing is mean, people like fall in love like this works like I'm like it works for a reason. Like I'm like there has to be a reason why it works. And I feel like I also love the idea of two people who didn't think they would be in love, like and who don't necessarily have like that. Like oh, I saw him from across the room. All of a sudden, our lives changed forever. Like just like people who like 
you know, grow into each other. Cause I feel like ultimately like that's such a like strong bond to like form. Like, and I love that. So I'm like, yes, like, I want to do like some like arranged marriage, like stuff. <laughs> I, I will be here to read it. I, I love arranged marriage. It's, it's one of my favorite tropes. Yeah, I'm like we gotta exchange books because your 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 sounds amazing. So I'm like, well, let's just like <laughs> let's awesome, back. awesome. Let's do it. Let's do it. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna need my uh, more books to my Emily Shrine. And oh, my yeah. <laughs> I mean, hopefully that shrine will be getting bigger soon. Uh, yeah. Ooh, ooh. Yeah, I love like the like, ooh, like what does this mean? What's going on? Oh, nothing. Ha <laughs> I am OG. I love like the inability of like people in publishing to keep secrets, but also like oh, the fact that everything is a secret. Like we we don't. I saw Amparo be like, okay, but when can I read all of these books? I'm already like, so by my calculation, I'm already like, <laughs> like oops. Like, I don't know. I, and the thing is, too, is like, authors are obviously bad at keeping secrets because we just like put like all this bullshit in like books. You know what I mean? Like, we just, we're just, we're just very good at like giving secrets away, like in like a sly way. And like, I feel like publishing never figured that out. They're like, oh yeah, we'll tell them not to tell anybody. They won't tell anyone. Like, meanwhile, yeah. like, like, we'll give them a secret to keep for like two years. They're not going <laughs> to tell anyone. Yeah, like, that'll work. And you're like, <laughs> you know, like, Stares at the camera like they're in the office. Yeah, like, mm, okay. <laughs> okay, what is the next question? Okay, what is your favorite thing about the fake dating trope? Everything. <laughs> you know, like asterisks, dying, everything. <laughs> I don't know. You go first. I genuinely like love. <laughs> um, I mean, so like we talked a little bit, like when we we're doing that panel, um, our like fake dating panel, um, which y'all can find, um, on. I yeah, <laughs> I think that that panel's on Adiba's uh, uh YouTube. YouTube. Right? Yeah. Okay, so you guys can look. I'll, I'll see if I can. I'll look for it and I'll like link it in the. Um, you know, the, 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 the section. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so we talked a little bit about that then. And I think one of the things I was talking about was like the way that like you can kind of start with a relationship, like already a little more established. Like you can do like the fun, like relationship couple-y things with characters who don't know each other as much. Um, and so you get like, like I know like with Make You Diary, I was like specifically throwing in some like super corny lines and like awkward date ideas, like all this kind of stuff. I think that's really fun. And like in a book where like the characters don't, like when the characters don't get together until maybe like 60, 70% in, like you don't get as much time to do that kind of stuff. So that's really fun. Uh, but another thing I really like about the fake dating trope is I feel like it's very like, like you, it's one of those tropes. And this is like one of my favorite things about like generally tropes, but I love tropes that allow you to put two people together who like either um, aren't right for each other or who think they're not right for each other or would like never be attracted to each other if not forced into like proximity with each other. Like, and so I love when you kind of have like this setup where like, if you had naturally just like set these two characters aside, they probably would have never like even like spoken to each other. But because of this like whole thing that we've got going on here, like this fake dating trope, like we now have this like weirdly intimate relationship. And like, and I love all of those like, what ifs? What if, what if, what if, yeah. oh my God. but like, but like, does he like me? Does he, does he not? No, oh my God, I don't know. I don't know, like what do I do? Like, I just, I love that, I love that turmoil. Like, yeah. <laughs> I love making them suffer. <laughs> I do like making them suffer too. I mean, cruelty is in general a big motivation. Um, I, I think for me, it's, it's the awkward. I, I love <laughs> how awkward it is to like, have a first kiss with someone that you don't, you don't necessarily have the intimacy with, so you're like, <laughs> you know, kind of like two birds almost beaking each other. That's so cute and awkward. And like, like you said, like all of those conversations, like I have a, a part, there's a, um, a part in my book, in like a love song where uh, Natch and Lillian, they're already like friends, but they have this bad argument and Nachi's talking to, to Brenda, to her friend, 
and just like complaining about this because they're not talking and stuff. And then Ben is like, just call him. Like, why are you being weird about this? And she's like, I'm not being weird. <laughs> Who's being weird? You're being weird. <laughs> and Ben is like, he's your friend. Like, would you have ghosted me forever if I were? And Natalie is like, yes, <laughs> it's the exact same thing. <laughs> <laughs> so like I love how awkward it is that like you <laughs> can't really talk to your friends about it because you don't want to admit that you have fallen in love with this person because you were in a fake relationship. It's not real. So yeah, I love how awkward it is. Awkward is so funny to write. I, it's, it's the best. It is, yeah. I feel like what I love too is like I'm just thinking about like specifically because like well like we wrote rom coms so like and like I know like some a lot of people don't like make like the differentiation between like a rom com and like a contemporary like romance or like contemporary with romance. Um but like the big difference like being that rom coms are like inherently funny. Like they're not they're not like I sprinkled a joke in here and there. It's like the whole concept is like funny. So like part of it is just like playing up that awkward, playing up that like, like, like the like, I like writing a story where you can laugh at your main character. Like yeah. you know, where you can like look at your main character and be like, oh my God, look at this loser. Like look at, look at us making like these horrible decisions. Like ha, loser. Like, and, it, <laughs> and it's like, like of course, like we still like care about our main characters and stuff, but it's just like, I think it's a lot of like, when I, something I love like with, when it comes to big dating is like, like you said, awkward. And it's just like, shoving him into like the most awkward yeah. situations like just like straight up like putting him in like like places where I'm like this is gonna be humiliating this is great he's gonna be so humiliating <laughs> exactly. exactly like i uh i i i do think that humor delivered through voice is fun and i like it but my favorite type of humor in books is when you and like you're able to close the book step aside and you look at the situation around and you're like Oh my God, look at this loser. You know, like, <laughs> oh God, you know, you're like, Jesus, the secondhand embarrassment I feel for this person's all of these bad decisions, you know, that you can, you can see yourself in it. You're like, okay, this is reasonable, but you're still like, <laughs> you know? so yeah, I, I love rom poms for that. Like, there are so many ways that it can be funny, but this is my favorite type of humor where you're just like, this is ridiculous. This is a ridiculous. <laughs> they're, they're so ridiculous. They're, they're pathetic. They're pathetic. <laughs> I, I, I make mess. That was like the first thing I came up with when I was coming up with like Nikki Diary was the, the concept of like Noah's 12 steps to the perfect relationship. And like the whole idea is that he's like, if you're gonna have the perfect relationship according to every romance and rom-com ever, you have to follow these, your relationship has to follow these 12 steps perfectly. Okay, when I first came up with that idea, I was literally in my kitchen, like writing it in a note on my phone and I like naming them and like laughing my ass off. And I was just like, this kid is so dumb. Like, oh my God, like you hear this? Oh my god, this is awful! Like, what a loser! Like, it is just so funny. Like, even to this day, like, I love. Like, I remember there were a couple like editors who were like, "Do we need the twelve steps?" I was like, "Yes, we need the twelve steps because they showcase what a loser he is." Like, this is like the epitome of him being a loser. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely, absolutely. Like, there's a scene, and this this is like situation of humor, I guess. But there's this scene where Natch is like, she's just done her nails. She's gone to the PR agency to sign the contract for uh, the non-disclosure agree disclosure agreement for basically the fake dating contract. And she's like, she's feeling confident, you know, like she just had an argument with her mom. And she's like, I got this, you know, and she's, she, she's like, her inner monologue is all about how amazing she is, how much she's sold, how, what a complete artist. And she's like, and you know, I have all of these assistants are like staring at me and they can't with my light, they just look away because I'm beaming. And then, you know, her, um, her producer takes her aside and is like, you have lattice in your teeth. <laughs> and she's like, got it. She's like, no, no, your your left came in. That's good like, <laughs> now. It's like, yeah, yeah, good. It's like, 
okay, now let's try again. She's <laughs> You know, it's just pathetic. Just, just pathetic. Uh-uh. She's so full of herself. She's not even embarrassed. She's just like, let's try again now. <laughs> you know, she she's my child. I adore her with all my might, but she's a loser. She's, and that's great. Like, that's honestly, it's lovely. Okay, yeah. let's answer one last question. Yes. Okay. What goals do you have for yourselves for your writing in the next five years? I love how like whenever whenever like a panel or event is like coming like to an end, somebody always shoots out like the hardest question ever written. <laughs> and you've like, okay, you've noticed who this is, right? Yes, it's I know. <laughs> We're gonna talk after this. <laughs> I'm joking, please. You're amazing. I love your question. <laughs> okay, but you go first. I am like, <laughs> I love it. Like, you go first. I'm like, okay, fine. I'll take the fall for both of us. <laughs> See how it is. Um, okay, so, God, goals for the next five years of writing. I mean, I'm yes. gonna say the obvious, like, like bare minimum, like more books. Um, <laughs> I definitely want to write more books. Um, I want to. Uh, I mean, a personal like goals I've kind of been like discussing is like branching out into more demographics and genres. So like middle grade, um, maybe adult, um, and like branching out from just like contemporary into like fantasy and like, I, I mean, I've written fantasy, I've written horror, I've written middle grade and adult, I've written like all over the map. So, I mean, ideally in the next five years, I would like to sell some of those like, chaotic you know stories um and i guess like as far as like personally like writing writing like i mean i've been wanting to branch into like graphic novels and i I have one and i started the script for it and i got like a page in so one day i would like to finish that that would be really cool do you want to illustrate as well because i know you are an artist too like i mean okay so it's kind of like it's like it's like up in the air because i'm like ideally if somebody else would want to illustrate it, I would not be opposed to that because that saves me so much time because illustrating takes forever. But like, I am planning on illustrating my own stuff. Like, I feel like, I feel like one, it makes it easier on me as far as the script writing goes because I don't have to be as specific. Um, but it's also like, like, I feel like as like a career move, I feel like it's easier when you can do it all yourself because then you don't have to worry about like trying to like partner with other people and like figure out like money and like all that kind of stuff. Um, so I'm gonna go with I'm gonna illustrate myself, um, but yeah. So I'd like to branch out into every category, not just some categories. I want to branch out into every category except for erotica. Though I did have an idea for like this like kinky adult romance, and like will I ever write it? Probably not. But I have an idea. If Johnny is there, Johnny knows what I'm talking about. Johnny's always mocking me for it. They better not. They better stay away. But yes, your turn. <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. So you're going to write everything? Everything, yes. In, five years, in the next five years, I'm going to write everything. Including uh, Western space opera. Yes. I'll figure it out. I'll figure it out. We got, got to figure I know it out. You will. I know you will. I am confident. <laughs> oh, OK. So Johnny just said, give us <laughs> wizard erotica. Sonny knows too. Sonny knows <laughs> Okay, yeah. this is what I mean when I say always. Oh, They're listening, Emery. We are listening. It's your turn. It's your turn, Gabby. <laughs> okay. Uh, my goals for the next five years is to become a bestseller author, sell my my rights to forty countries, and have four seasons and a movie adapted. No, I, I really, I genuinely, this was a joke because none of these things are up to me. I do have some goals, but I, I, I have, I have quarter goals, right? And they are planned. I have goals to the second quarter of this year, the first, second, and third quarter. I don't even have goals to the last quarter of the year. For the last quarter, I'm just like, depends on what happens. You know, with the other stuff, 
I don't know. I used to really plan stuff ahead, like so hard, like plan to the detail. But then I feel like when I really got here, I realized we don't have control of anything. Yeah. Like, like for example, everybody was like, okay, so you're gonna, um, when I was on sub with my debut, everybody, including my agent were like, okay, so probably you're gonna sell and then in 12, in 18 months, two years, you're gonna have your debut. You're gonna have, you know, I sold my, um, I sold my debut in September to be published this August. So I don't know, man. It's like <laughs> yeah, things happen, and it's all a surprise. And yeah, and also, I I don't know if I'm supposed to say this, but like this is the second time I've said this, and I'm not sure I can yet. But like YOLO, you know, like just. Just, just like, <laughs> I like last year at this in this moment in time I was still revising for my first book for my debut book but this year I will have three books out because I'm gonna have my debut and I'm gonna have two licensing books out that I still haven't even announced I haven't even talked about them but they're gonna be out and like when will I ever talk about them? I don't know. Maybe only when they come out because everything in publishing is so weird. So like, I don't know. I talked to my agent about this last week and she was like, look, I genuinely don't know. So it's possible you are only going to be able to talk about this in like the week they come out. Yeah, I'm like, publishing is literally like everybody is constantly sitting on like seven secrets that we're not allowed yeah. to share. And like, we have no idea why, and nobody knows when, and like. Yeah, like why are these things a secret? Like, I'm gonna be honest, like in the retails, uh, retailer websites, my name is listed as the author already for these books. <laughs> like, if people can see it in, in, in like Target, why can't I talk about this? That's, yeah, that's weird. <laughs> but we, okay. We say okay, and we wait for the green light. So, okay. Yeah, the struggle. This, this is the struggle of being in this industry. Yeah. It's so like weird. And, and the worst part is like, if you ask somebody else like, oh, like when did you get to announce? They'll be like, oh, like this. But then like, it has nothing to do with what's gonna happen for you because everybody's so different. Exactly. And like, yeah, there's just like yeah. no rhyme or reason or anything. And my, my debut was actually super fast. Like we just, we decided on a, we spent like one month exchanging emails, deciding on the title because Like a Love Song was not my original title. And then like literally after that, they were like, okay, I just sent it to like Publishers Weekly and they're gonna announce like tonight. It's like, okay. And then it was announced like a week after they, they made the first offer. So like, it was so fast, a week, no, a month. But it was so fast, so fast. And I, I know people that are, have been sitting, I have this friend, she has already written the whole book. It's She's in line edits now, and she still hasn't announced the book. She has been working on the book for two years. She's on line edits. The book is probably gonna come out this year, and she hasn't announced it yet. Yeah, like, I'm like, it took me seven months to announce my book. And then I have another friend, I have another friend that's been, a, it, it's a year like it's been like a year no no one else um i've got <laughs> like I, yeah like there's so many people i feel like it's like what is that and then meanwhile like yeah i know some people it's literally like okay cool like you know i got the offer like two weeks ago time to announce i'm like <sighs> yeah 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 i feel like if if it had been for for this friend of mine it's not her debut so she's like well okay so she's not like stressing about this but when it's your debut i feel like it's so much more stressful. it's so much worse yeah like I can, I am so glad that I can talk about my debut. So I'm not stressing about these books that I can't talk about because it's like, you know, they're licensing books. It's okay. You know, it's basically like work for hire. So I'm like, hey, it's fine. When I talk about it, I'll talk about it. But if I couldn't talk about my debut, oh, the yeah, end, like, I would feel. And I feel like it's just like, like once you have like a book you can talk about, it's a little less obnoxious having to like wait. Cause like, 
Yeah. I think it's already been kind of like, I've already implied that I'm like waiting to announce something and I've been waiting on that for a long time. But like, it's like the same, I think it's the same wait that I did like so far that I did with Meet You Diary originally. And like with Meet You Diary, it was hell on earth. Like I was dying. Like I was like, like I was like, at first I was like, I'm not gonna tell anybody. And then like, as I got closer, I was like telling every single person like I knew like in real life, like guess what happened? Like I saw the blog. Like I was like, I hate that I can't announce it. But like, meanwhile, like another project, like just anything that comes after, I feel like automatically is just less bad because you already have something that you can talk about. So like, at least you aren't like on the outside completely, but like, yeah. I love that. Um, so literally my mom knows about all of my publishing stuff and she tells everyone. Even like people that have no idea how publishing works, she will tell them about all of my publishing secrets that like not even my friends know. My mom will be like on the supermarket and then she will start conversation with the cashier about like the weather. And then she will go like, so my daughter, <laughs> She's a writer, you know. <laughs> Let me just show you the cover to her new book. <laughs> and like, my friends don't know. And my mom would be like, showing literally everyone who is not interested at all. But um, I mean, my mom's right. Nobody's going to, none of these people are gonna blast me on the internet and, you know, tell my editors that I, that they know. So, okay, I guess. Plus, yeah, everybody's yeah. Brazilian. They're not even gonna read my book. It's okay. It's like take take what you can get. Like it's fine. Like like tell tell whoever you can get away with telling is my rule. I'm like I'll tell as many people as long as I won't get in trouble for telling. Yeah, you know that's that's absolutely fair. That's absolutely. Fair. <laughs> I am I am in that uh, that point where I can still talk about my books like very comfortably around here because I haven't sold any Brazilian rights yet. Which is not a good thing, by the way. At publishing, fix yeah. this. I want to sell Brazilian rights. I want to be published in my home country. But since you know, uh, only three percent of the Brazilian population knows English, I get to be like basically talk about it all the time and show my cover to everyone and stuff like in my family and, and like friends and stuff. And they'd be like, "Oh, how nice!" My mom wanted to post my cover like the second I sent her the email. Like she wanted to post it on Facebook <laughs> to like show to her like high school friends, you know, for them to be jealous. Like mom, no, <laughs> like the mock, you know, of the cover with just like the draft, not even in color. Like mom, you can do that. So she's, she's amazing. But yeah, no sense of secrecy whatsoever. <laughs> I mean, I mean, at least, at least she supports, right? Like that's like the ultimate. Yeah, ah, she's so supportive, and you know, she's really supportive of my friends as well. Like one of the things she hates the most about publishing, and she talks about it frequently, is that the Henna Wars by Adipa Jagardar is not yet published in Portuguese, so she can't read it. And um, it's a really good book. If you are watching, haven't read it, you all should. And and it's by one of my closest friends. So she's always complaining about it. And she, she, sometimes she asks me as if I can control it. She's like, <laughs> when is that gonna happen? When are they publishing a diva's book? And I'm like, mom, if I had any control over this, you don't think I, I would have my book translated? <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't have any contacts in Brazilian publishers. She's like, hmm. Okay, well, so we are gonna wrap it up here. Um, okay. But I wanna say thank you to everyone for coming. Um, do you want to give your sign off, like your bio link or uh, where they can find you? And You can find me at, at Gabby with uh, BH on Instagram, at Gabby Martins. You probably won't know how to write Martins though. Uh, just Gabriela writes on dot uh, com that's my website you can find all the links there thank you so much for coming today this has been amazing fun emery thank you so much for hosting i will be watching every monday every episode this was amazing 
And don't forget to pre-order Meet Cute Diary. Yes. And of course, you can find me at emerylybooks.com. You'll also find, um, if you pre-order the book, I'm doing um, a pre-order campaign where you'll get uh, a double-sided postcard, a sticker sheet, and oh, a signed book plate. Um, and basically, the more people pre-order, the more free stuff I'm giving away in regards to Meet Cute Diary. So if you are interested in the book, you should pre-order it and you should submit your receipt early because we are also limited on certain um, book plate designs. So you want to get in as soon as you can so you can get the one that you want. Um, yeah. Yes. You can also pre-order Like a Love Song. I don't have any of those cool stuff yet. <laughs> you When's your release date again? My publishing date? Yes. August 3rd. August 3rd. Okay. August 3rd. Yes. And then Meet Your Diary is out May 4th. Um, so thank you all for coming and make sure to um, come back like every week. I'll be doing Meet Cute Mondays every week um, through May 3rd, the day before my book releases. So stop by every week um, and we I'll be talking with a bunch of different romance authors and it's going to be a lot of fun. So please come back. <laughs> thank you. Bye everyone. Bye.